Following a transfer. From atop the lowest state theater building. Colossal, tremendous. WH. Tales of intrigue, adventure, and the mysterious occult that will stir your imagination and make your very blood run cold. This is Dark Adventure Radio Theater, featuring your host, Lester Mayhew. Today's episode, The Shunned House, a chilling story by the master of the weird tale, H.P. Lovecraft. On College Hill in picturesque Providence, Rhode Island, stands a house. To the casual observer, it follows the average colonial lines of the middle 18th century. It faces south, with one gable end buried to the lower windows in the eastward rising hill, and the other exposed to the foundations toward the street. It's not especially remarkable. One might even call it quaint. Yet for those who know its strange and gruesome history, it symbolizes terror itself. Can an investigation into the house reveal a way to cleanse it of its unholy pall, or merely confirm it as an abode of enduring evil? But first, a word from our sponsor. Hello, Martha. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayhew. Were you out on a toot last night, Martha? You don't seem to have much pep. What's wrong? Gee, Mr. Mayhew, I don't know. I'm just feeling out of sorts today. I haven't been sleeping well, and... No? Well, not to worry. I've got something that's just the ticket right here. Veronal. Veronal. That's right. Veronal. It's the modern medical miracle that you're looking for. Gosh, can it help me sleep? You bet it can. This new European formula uses soothing barbiturates to treat insomnia induced by nervous excitability. Barbitu what? <laughs> no need to worry about them. They're modern medicines made to soothe the problems of modern life. It sounds perfect. Here. Try a few tonight, and you'll be sleeping like a baby. Thank you, Mr. Mayhew. <laughs> no, thank you, Veronal. Don't let your neuroses and hysteria keep you from the restful sleep you deserve. Try Veronal tonight. Available from your neighborhood druggist. And now, Dark Adventure Radio Theater presents The Shunned House. From even the greatest of horrors, irony is seldom absent. For instance, in the ancient city of Providence, Edgar Allan Poe used to stroll. Poe's favorite walk led northward, along Benefit Street, and the nearby churchyard of St. John's, whose 18th century gravestones had for him a peculiar fascination. Now the irony is this. In this walk, the master of the terrible and the bizarre was obliged to pass a dingy, antiquated house. It does not appear that he ever wrote or spoke of it, nor is there any evidence that he even noticed it. And yet, that house, to the two persons in possession of certain information, equals or outranks in horror the wildest fantasy of the author who so often passed it unknowingly, and stands starkly leering as a symbol of all that is unutterably hideous. So, uh, like I told you, Clifford, today we're going to use the Bergonic chair for your therapy. Uh, go ahead, have a seat. <laughs> I think you'll find it's quite comfortable. Very well, Doctor. I have a few questions for you while the nurse attaches some electrodes. Just lean back. There you go. When was the last time you saw your great uncle? The last time I... I don't really recall. Um... Maybe it was... Uh, Ow! That's cold. Think hard. It might come to you. Ah, uh, no. Sorry, I, I don't recall exactly. Pardon me, I just need to run this wire under your arm. What about the house? Have you ever been to the house on Benefit Street? Sorry, what house? You know the one I mean. Uh, 
I, I'm not sure. I, I know Benefit Street, but I don't think I've ever been inside any of the houses there. Never been inside? Try to remember. No, no. Never. Well, why? He's ready, Doctor. Uh, thank you, Nurse Piva. Uh, so, Clifford, today's therapy with the Burgonic chair will try to unlock some memories which are unavailable to your conscious mind. The electrical current will come out of the transformer there, and very small voltages will pass through the electrodes on your skin, through your skull, stimulating cognition in the brain. It doesn't take long. You say it doesn't hurt, right? Oh, oh, oh. heavens no. Uh, many of my patients actually find it uh, quite pleasant and enjoy their sessions. Activate the electroflow and set the sinusoidal oscillator to 60 hertz, please, Nurse Piva. Comfortable, I guess. I <laughs> Just try to relax. I want you to think about your great uncle and the house on Benefit Street. Oh, and uh, one last thing. Open, please. What? Open your mouth. Uh, just bite down on the wood, Clifford. What's this for? <laughs> we wouldn't want you to bite your own tongue, would we? <laughs> now, picture your great uncle. Picture that house. Nurse, set the Fourier transformer to 800 milliampers. Stand clear. And... <laughs> Disengage. Please remove the bite guard. Clifford, keep your eyes closed. Now tell me what you see. I can't hear you, Clifford. I can't. I, I, I don't. What do you see? It's dark. You can open your eyes, Clifford. They are open. I can't see anything. The door latched shut behind me. What door is this? The cellar door. The cellar is your house? No. Whose house are you in, Clifford? I don't know. It's important that you remember. Where are you? It's... it's that haunted house, the one on Benefit Street. What are you doing in a haunted house, Clifford? Playing? We thought it would be fun. Come on, let's go on up to the attic. I'm not going up there. What? Are you scared, Donovan? No. Ha! I'm not scared. Last one there's a rotten egg. Come on, come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. on. Joshy says there's ghosts up there. He thinks he knows everything. I bet Joshy's never even been in the attic. My brother says a vampire lived in this house. What's a vampire? They're like monsters who don't ever die and they drink people's blood. My brother says it's still here. Come on. The attic's up here. Nothing up here but a lot of old junk. Still, it's pretty creepy looking. Hey, let's play hide and seek. Here? Don't be such a nervous Nelly. Gage, count to ten. Not enough. I'll count to fifty. Too much. It should be twenty-five. Close your eyes. They're closed. Twenty-five. Shh. Twenty-four. <laughs> Twenty-three. <laughs> Twenty-one. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Wait, I'm not ready. You're doing very well, Clifford. What else do you remember? I went downstairs, all the way into the cellar, and then... The door. It's stuck, and it's dark. What happened then, Clifford? I... I don't know. It's safe to remember. I... Nothing will hurt you here. A hundred more milliamps, nurse. <laughs> what do you see? It's all dark. But there's something down by the floor. It's kind of like smoke, sort of coming up from the ground. Oh, the smell! Oh, it touches me! It's, it's all around me! Clifford! Oh, Uncle Elihu! Uh, are you all right there, lad? It's only me. Uh, are you hurt? No, sir. Oh, come on. The others are upstairs. Now, what have I told you about abandoned houses? Well, not to play in them. And about this house? I know, but Neil said... Oh, Neil's? That scoundrel. If Neil's told you to jump off the Washington Bridge, would you do that too? I'm serious, Clifford. I found him. He was down we, cellar. We, we didn't mean it. So I mean, Neil said trouble. we were All supposed right, to hide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Dr. Sorry. Ripple. Donovan, I expect you to know better. You too, Heather. And Neil's, you're a terrible influence, young man. Now, I don't ever want to hear of you setting foot in this house again. Any of you. You understand? It won't happen again. Sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. Sorry, sir. Get on home. Oh, okay. Bye, Sorry. Bye. 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 Sorry. Thanks, Sorry. Bye. See you tomorrow. And you. You're coming with me. You sure you're all right? 
Let's get you home. Delilah's making donuts. Donuts? Here we are. Let's get inside. We're back. Clifford Babbitt, where have you been, child? Delilah, a ghost almost got me today, but Uncle Elihu saved me. Hmm. Is that so? Well, he did you a fair turn. Did you say thank you for that? Thank you, Uncle Elihu. Oh, evening, Dr. Whipple, and thank you for fetching him. Evening, Delilah. Where's Susie? Gone to bed? Yes, sir. Mrs. Babbitt said her head was about to split open. I sent her up with a compress. I got a cold supper for you in the icebox. Oh, and I put a pot of coffee on. Sounds like you two had a big afternoon. (laughs) Big enough. But I can't say as we saw any ghosts. But everybody knows that house is haunted. Do they? What house is that? The creepy one up on Benefit Street. The one with the... I know the one you mean. Not a soul's lived in there as long as I can remember. It's unlucky. And in fairness to Clifford, folks do say things about that place, Dr. Whipple. Oh, I know. It's a strange place. Terrible history. I've looked into it, but not once have I heard a tale of rattling chains or wailing ghosts in that house. Even when I was a girl, everyone knew to steer clear of that place. Everyone but this one and his friends. It was Neil's fault. Serves him right to have the bejesus scared out of him. What do you mean when you say you looked into it? Oh, one of my colleagues shared some information with me shortly after I finished medical school. It piqued my curiosity and I... Looked into it. I conducted a bit of an investigation. (laughs) I've got volumes and volumes of notes. Mm Mm-hmm. And you wonder where Clifford gets it from. Well, but in my case, it was science. (laughs) Of course, Doctor. So, what's wrong with it? I can't really say. What I do know is a frightful number of persons have died there. Too many. That and decades of neglect... No one will rent the place. It sits there, brooding and abandoned. Why on earth don't they just tear it down? They can't. 17th century house like that, it's on the registry of historic buildings. What happened to the people? Did the ghosts get them? No. Oh, oh, Gage's brother said the house has vampires. Vampires? Lord have mercy. That boy spends too much time reading dime novels. Vampires. (laughs) No, I don't think that's it either. Truly, they're... There was never just one cause of the deaths. Let's just say the building was insalubrious. Each case was different so that each one died the sooner from whatever tendency to weakness he may have naturally had. And those who didn't die displayed in varying degrees a type of anemia or consumption, sometimes a decline of the mental faculties. Insalubrious! (laughs) I'm going to remember that one. You, on the other hand, don't seem any the worse for wear from today's adventure. I want to read all your notes on the place, Uncle Elihu. (laughs) And you might die of boredom. (laughs) No, there was something in the cellar today. It smelled funny, and I saw something. Did you now? What was that? There's white stuff, that kind that grows on dirt. That sounds like good old-fashioned mold or fungus to me. Lots of cellars have... No, no, this was something dark, sort of yellow and shimmery, coming up from the ground. Dr. Whipple? Mm. Best remedy for that, lad, is one of Delilah's delightful donuts, (laughs) right? And a sound night's rest. So, Dr. Wade, were you able to get anything out of Babbitt? Did he, uh, remember anything? Uh, yes, Detective. I'm pleased to say he did. Uh, following the electroconvulsive therapy, he was able to share a number of memories. What about the uncle? Dr. Whipple featured prominently in his recollections. Well, anything on the uncle's current whereabouts? Uh, not yet. But I have another session with him in just a few minutes. I'm hopeful he'll continue to regain memories. We can't wait forever, Doctor. Oh, of course, I understand, but... We're talking the human mind, Detective. It moves at its own pace. Sure, but the DA wants to know if we got enough evidence to charge him. Uh, That is not my concern, Detective Brennan. I'm not aware that any crime has been committed. Do you even know if the uncle's dead? We know no one's seen Elihu Whipple since the night he and his nephew went to that house. Memory loss? (laughs) Damn convenient if you ask me. Well, I assure you, there's nothing convenient about it, but I'm planning to play the uh, Edaphone recording to see if that 
jogs his memory. If you ask me, there's better ways to jog. I didn't ask you, Detective. And make no mistake, it's not my job to extract a confession for you. My medical opinion is that something traumatic happened to Clifford that night. I'll, uh, I'll let you know what progress we make. I'll show myself out. Oh, uh, Detective, I... Mr. Babbitt? Good day, Dr. Waite. Come in, Clifford. Have a seat. How have you been feeling since our last session? Good, I suppose. Uh, I have been a little sore. <laughs> that can happen with the muscle spasms. Uh, comfortable now? Yes, thank you. Last week, you were telling me about playing a game in the haunted house and your uncle... Right. Um, he knew a lot about the house. I'd always ask him to tell me stories about the place, but he said that those stories weren't for children. Hmm. How did that make you feel? Even more curious, I suppose. Why do you think both of you were so fascinated by that house? I don't know. It was a mystery, I guess. Something exciting. Our own haunted house. Uh, your uncle was a physician. Did he think your obsession was a healthy one? <laughs> I wouldn't say I was obsessed. Just interested. My great uncle, now he, was obsessed. Oh, go on. He'd always say it started just after he graduated from medical school. He was an apprentice to Dr. Hopkins here in Providence back in, oh, must have been the 1850s. So, Dr. Whipple, what did they teach you about death certificates? Nothing much. They document the death. Manner, mechanism, proximate cause, underlying cause, etc., etc. It's... It's paperwork. True. <laughs> They're not glamorous, but every death, no matter how humble, no matter how notorious, deserves to be properly recorded. Once you learn to read them properly, you'll see everyone tells a story. Then you can learn to write one properly. Yes, Dr. Hopkins. Did you take a look at the samples I gave you? Yes, sir. <laughs> and? Well, I noticed this group of fever victims, all lacking in blood. Yes. Well... Uh, what about them? They all lived at the same address in Benefit Street, but they died years, decades apart, with the same symptoms. Strange. Well done! Very perceptive, Dr. Whipple! <laughs> yes, it is strange. The old Harris place. Sir? I was never able to specify the manner of death, but it illustrates my point. You see, all the certificates are marked undetermined. But these records all indicate it was some kind of anemia. It says here, the blood... Oh, you might think that. They were quite anemic. All four of them. Well, then wouldn't that count as natural death? Natural? <laughs> Each one of them presented with a kind of progressive madness. They became a danger to their own families. Attempted to attack relatives in the house. To cut their necks or wrists. Wait, each of them did this? Oh, yes. The authorities tended to overlook it at the time. These patients were all uneducated folks of a decidedly lower station. No one of good reputation would live in that house. So these depredations were ignored. Well, that doesn't seem right. You'll find, young man, that sometimes a physician feels pressured to sign off on a document before completely understanding its story. But some stories aren't so easy to tell. Like how all four of these patients were observed to babble in French, a language I'm quite certain none of them studied to any extent. What? They... What are you saying? It seems old Doc Hopkins was fascinated with the mystery of the Harris House, and he passed that fascination on to my uncle. Back then, the two of them would discuss it over drinks at the Old Turk's Head Tavern. On the hill. So, William Harris built the house back in 1763 and moved in with his wife, Roby Dexter, and their children, Elkanah, Abigail, Ruth, and William Jr. Roby had a stillborn boy not long after. That happens. Hmm. No child has been born alive in that house, Dr. Whipple. Ever? <laughs> it's been, what, more than 75 years? Not a one. Let's see. 
The Harris maid, Hannah Bowen, died shortly after that child. Another servant, Eli Ledison, uh, complained of sickness and a year later he was dead. William Harris himself died right after. And two years later, his daughter, Ilkana. Oh, good God. That pushed his wife, the unfortunate Roby Harris, to madness. The poor woman. No, oh, we're not done yet. Roby's sister, Mercy Dexter, moved in to help care for the family. And she took ill. Then Mahitable Pierce, the maid hired to replace Hannah Bowen, died. And her counterpart, a servant named Preserved Smith, left the family service saying he disliked the smell of the place. And all this happened over how many years? Five. <laughs> That's... Mercy hired two new servants, Anne White and Zena Slow. Mm, and they died? Well, not exactly. It seems Anne was quite the gossip, spreading rumours about the house, so Mercy fired her. Replaced her with a woman named Mariah Robbins. But Zenas Lowe, yes, he died in 1772. This is unbelievable. It's all well documented. Poor Ruby Harris' madness progressed. There's accounts of her screaming out the contents of her dreams. And very vivid, coarse French. And you say she didn't know French? Not when she was lucid. William Jr. couldn't endure his mother's screaming and moved out to live with a cousin, Peleg Harris. About a year later, poor Mad Roby was dead. William went on to join the army and made his way up the ranks through the Revolutionary War. Eventually, he moved back home with a new bride, Phoebe Hetfield, from Elizabethtown. No more now. Enough. He found his aunt, Mercy, a shriveled shell of her former self cared for by Mariah, the only remaining servant. You can probably imagine what's next. Phoebe delivered a stillborn daughter early in 1782, and not long after that, Mercy died. Clearly, people must have realized there was... Something wrong there. Oh, I. William built a new house in Westminster Street. In 1785, his son, Duty, was born there. And? William and Phoebe died in 1797, but I don't think there's anything strange in that. That was the year of the yellow fever epidemic. Their son, Duty, was raised by Peleg Harris's son, Rathbone. Good Lord. Uh, Barman, two more brandies. Uh, in 1804... The town council demanded the place be fumigated with sulphur, tar, and gum camphor. Did that help? What do you think? To your very good health, Dr. Whipple. <laughs> there were others, of course. Guinevere Stafford back in 1815. A sweet old lady and a boarder in that house. Ah, yes, here's her death certificate. Hmm. Oh, yes. I was her physician. She was wasting away. Anemic like the others, she was transfigured most horribly. She'd stare at me, eyes glassy, but I'd see these flashes of a hunger, I suppose you'd call it. But that wasn't the half of it. What do you mean? I had a patient named Eleazar Durfee. He was a school teacher, a middle-aged fella. Uh, this would have been in uh, 45. A full 30 years later. Just so. Mr. Durfee, he rented a room in that house. When I went to see him, he was sickly and weak, and he too was changed. A sort of vacant look in his eyes. And he... Did you see the same flashes of... The man barely had the strength to lift his arm. There was something in the way he looked at me I'll never forget. Mr. Durfee, I want you to put this sugar cube under your tongue. It has laudanum on it. It'll help you sleep. Open up now. What's that? Closer. Oh, Eliezer, stop it! Tried to bite my throat. Good Lord. 
Did the sedative calm him? Eleazar Durfee was dead before I reached the bottom of the stairs. All these people in that house, what do you think it was? As I wrote on the certificates, undetermined. It's late, and I'm old. I should be getting home. Yes, of course. This house, it's still there? Oh, yes. (laughs) Walk down Benefit Street on your way home. You'll know it when you see it. So yes, to use your words, my uncle may have become obsessed. Clearly there was something deeply wrong there. Something terrible connected with that house and not with the family. And what about you, Clifford? Did your uncle pass his obsession on to you? He didn't want to. I was always begging him to tell me more about the place, but he'd never say a thing. It wasn't until a couple of years ago A few months after I graduated from college, I finally got him to engage with me at all on the topic. I'm telling you, the place is evil. Evil? (laughs) When you were a boy, it was ghosts. So tell me, what evil is it, exactly? Uh, uh, Well, it... Where does it come from? What does it do? I I don't know, but... Facts, young man. We'll get nowhere with your proclamations and superstitions. That's for simpletons. Be off with your talk of evil. Come back to me with facts, evidence. Then we'll talk. So I set out to find the proof my uncle demanded. Proof that went beyond his accounting of the house's countless tragedies. Evidence that might prove what I could feel in my heart. Hmm, Interesting. Uh, Now, tell me about that. I'd felt it ever since I was a boy. I mean, intellectually, I could understand that I got scared there when I was a kid. But... Go on. There was really something there. Something unlike anything I'd ever felt before or since. And it was coming for me. For you? uh, Personally? I don't... I wanted to prove it to my uncle and to myself. My great uncle was uncomfortable with the term, but I could feel there was something evil about that house. So what did you do? I did my research, learned everything I could about it. I even studied French so I could read the Parisian Occult Journal Revue de Dumont in the search for clues. Did you really? Mm Mm-hmm. I went to the Essex Institute. Do you know it? Mm. I saw the poor doomed Harris family. Paintings of poor Roby and William, of Mercy Dexter and others. I found some utterly fascinating old documents there. Well, such as? Well, I found a curious account from a quilting bee back in 1773 attended by Anne White. Remember her? Uh... She was the Harris's servant dismissed for her loose tongue. Be a dear, Georgianne, and pass the beeswax. Heavens, but this thread wants to tangle. Here you are, Mary. I'll trade you for the plumbago. I can barely see my markings here. This embroidery is certainly fine work. The Gotchens will not have had a lovelier quilt, I'm sure. It'll be a great comfort for them. Anne, I've heard you're in service once again. Is the work treating you well? Well enough. But it's work, though, isn't it? <laughs> but yes, we're off to a solid beginning. And the family? What are they like? Decent enough, Megan. A far cry better than before. You mean the Harrises? Oh, Bonnie. Speak not their name. A curse upon them. I'd swear that house of theirs is accursed already. That's what happens if you build over old berry in the ground. Aye, a curse. It was no curse. I told him what it was, but the missus refused to believe me. What was it? I'm not to repeat it. Come now. You can tell us. A vampire. Oh, (gasps) buried under the house. Lord, protect us. What's that? Dead beings who live on. Feeding on the blood or breath of the living. Living dead? I never heard of such an infernal notion. No. Everyone in Exeter knows about them. They send their prey and shapes or spirits abroad by night. Mm -hmm. My grandmother says the only way to kill one is to exhume it and burn its heart. Or at least drive a stake through it. Aye, that's what they do in Exeter. Preserver Smith, did you know him? Worked at the house before me. I'll never forget him telling me. 
Something sucked his breath at night. Everyone knows there's something wrong in that house. Mm -hmm. The family, the servants dying left and right. I kenned it, Mary. And all I did was insist the cellar be searched for revenants. Mm -hmm. Does that seem like too much to ask? Perfectly Mm -hmm. reasonable, if you ask me. Well, Robbie Harris said it was presumptuous for a servant to demand such a thing. Gave me the boot. She didn't, (gasps) from what I hear. Robbie Harris has all but lost her wits entirely. Drove me mad and I was only there but a few years. The hittable Pierce? She used to work for the family. She bade me not to repeat it, but... Mercy Dexter herself told her of the queer things Robbie says and does. Like what? You need to eat. You won't get your strength back without some food in you. I can't get my strength back with him watching me. Who's watching you, Roby? He is. Roby, there's no one. You can't see him. He'll wait until you go all classy-eyed, lurking. Who, Roby? Who is it? What? What did you say? J'ai grand soif de vous. Oh, stop it now, Roby. Stop that prattling. You know I don't understand it. He's killing me, Mercy. Teeth like knives. <laughs> well, that sounds disturbing. Uh, did you find these accounts credible, Clifford? I looked for corroborating documents. A librarian. Mrs. Cole at the Shepley Library found just what I was after. And what was that? Minutes from a city council meeting in 1697. 1697? Well, your research certainly does sound exceptionally thorough. Did you feel it was necessary to... Now, this was really important. It revealed a whole new angle on all of it. And that resolves the issue appertaining to the Tanner's Pits. On. Next on the docket is a motion as to whether to permit a lease upon the tract of the subdivided lands of the Throckmorton property. Permission to address this issue, Magistrate. Uh, proceed, Goodman Price. Thank you. Friends, the question at hand here is not merely whether land from the Throckmorton parcel should be leased, but to whom? Providence is a thriving community, robust in agriculture, trade and manufacture. We are the envy of the other colonies. And why is this so? We have honoured the heritage of our own land. Our colony is peopled with good, hard-working English folks, maintaining our traditions and folk ways. Now, let us see. The name of the proposed tenant is... Etienne Rowley. Does that sound like a good English name to ye? It's French as frogs likes. A Frenchman proposes to move his whole family into our midst. Now this proposed lease is only for land up on the hill, but really, who among us? What good English citizens of Providence want to allow foreign elements so close to the city? To our wives and children. And make no mistake here, friends, the Lisi is a Huguenot and a swarthy one at that. I've looked into the man and by all accounts he's not known as a skilled tradesman. No, he's bookish. And we all know the French are inclined to be litigious against their English neighbours. No, it's time we take a firm stand and send these foreigners... Objection. Yes, Mr. Louse. Is it the purpose of this council to assassinate the character of a man unable to stand before us to defend himself? Come now, sir. 
Do you contest the veracity of my claims? You tell us Monsieur Roulet is a Huguenot from France. But a man of your erudition is surely familiar with the Edict of Nantes, are you not? Where the French king granted French Protestants, the uh, so-called Huguenots, the same rights as Catholics. And of course, a learned fellow such as you knows that 12 years ago, King Louis XIV revoked those protections. Our hard-working Protestant brethren suddenly found themselves vilified and persecuted in their own country. Some of us here know that experience for ourselves all too well. They've been forced to flee their homes in France. Some have sought refuge here. The Roulet family tried to settle in East Greenwich. Citizens there, whose thinking was in line with our esteemed Master Price, said no and cast them out. Without a home, now they come here to Providence, our city famed as a refuge for the, the free, odd, and dissenting. Shall we turn them away? Shall we behave as the French king does? Or shall we embrace this learned man as our brother? I have spake with Pardon Tillingist, and he's willing to put Monsieur Roulet to work as a clerk in his warehouse. Let us open our hearts and grant permission for the lease of this property. What say you? So, the Roulets came around 1697 from Cod in France via East Greenwich, and the selectmen allowed them to settle on the very property where the Harris House would one day be built. Finally, our French connection. And the quilters were right. The Roulets had indeed laid out a graveyard behind their cottage, and no record of any transfer of graves existed. The Harris House was built right on top of it. How did that discovery make you feel? Triumphant! It was starting to make sense. Was it? Etienne's son, Paul, apparently was quite a character, and his erratic behavior drew the ire of the community. Of course, Providence never shared in the witchcraft panic of her Puritan neighbors, but folks took note that his prayers were neither uttered at the proper time nor directed toward the proper object. To what object were they directed? The records never got that specific. But whatever it was, it was enough to set off a riot around 1737 that wiped out the family entirely. Uh, let, let's get back no, to... No, no, wait. I found something else. It was an account of one Jacques Roulet of Cod, France, who, in 1598, was condemned as a demoniac. Uh, that's disconcerting. He had been found covered in blood and shreds of flesh in some woods, shortly after the killing of a boy by a pair of wolves. One wolf was seen to lope away unhurt. Quite a coincidence, eh? Another roulet? In Cod? Uh, perhaps, but... Uh... Had anyone known of it back in 1697, well, I'm sure the selectmen would have voted differently. But perhaps the story somehow made its way to Providence. Perhaps that was the fuel for the 1737 riots. Well, uh, this is quite a history you were putting together, but I'd like to return to the present. Yes, but yes, me too. I'd cover the past, but what of the present? That's why I spoke to Carrington Harris. And who's that? He's the current owner of the house, the last in his family line. And uh, was your uncle present for this meeting? No, no. I was hoping to amass all the information I could and then give him what he wanted. Facts. I see. It's not right. You going behind your uncle's back, Clifford. Oh, I'll tell him, Delilah. I'm gathering this information for him. Well, don't expect me to be keeping secrets for you. I don't. I... <laughs> there he is. Mr. Harris, I presume. Please, come in. May I take your hat? Why, yes. Thank you. May I introduce Clifford Babbitt? Mr. Harris? Thank you so much for coming, Mr. Harris. Ah, you can call me Carrington. Ah, Carrington, have a seat. Delilah, would you uh, bring us some tea? Oh, it's all ready. I'll just get it. Uh, so, this is all about the Benefit Street house, eh? Now, you seem awfully young to be a property broker. Me? <laughs> oh, yes. I, I mean, I mean, no. I, I'm not looking to buy it. Are you trying to sell it? <laughs> As if I could. No one wants the place. It's been nothing but an albatross. Can't use it, can't rent it, can't get rid of it. Have you ever 
lived in it? Me? Good lord, no. The place doesn't even have plumbing. No one in the family has lived there in oh, over a hundred years. Hasn't been a tenant of any kind since the Civil War. I, I, I haven't even been in it myself but a few times. Oh, really? Yes, just on assessment matters. Well, my father used to store some old junk in there, but the roof barely keeps the rain out. Uh, have you ever had to deal with trespassers or squatters or anything like that? Oh, no, not really. Even the hobos leave it alone. Uh, why do you ask? I just thought there might be reports of, I don't know, people who had seen... Seen what? Here you are, gentlemen. There's sugar and lemon here if you want it. Thank you, Delilah. Uh, we, we can pour for ourselves. Oh, nonsense. You just go right on like I'm not even here. Uh, you were saying reports of, uh, of what? Of, um... Of mischievous children playing where they shouldn't? No, not... Oh, well, that's yes. Well, there's a handyman that keeps the fence in good repair. We haven't had too much trouble. You're aware that there are lots of old stories about the place, aren't you? Oh, of course. All sorts of crazy tales. I wouldn't have given them a second thought, but they're what makes the place impossible to rent. Ah, uh, well, I have been studying them. Uh, there are some fascinating details in old town records. Studying them? Uh, why? What? What's this all about? Uh, oh, oh no, I, I mean, it's nothing. It's just that the house, uh, well, my great uncle too, uh, uh, who, a doctor, he knew that... Uh, Mr. Babbitt and his great uncle, Dr. Whipple, have long had a purely historical interest in that house of yours, Mr. Harris. They're a pair of academics. They don't mean any harm. I see. Well then, I, I suspect you already know more about the place than I do. You know, I had a great uncle myself, <laughs> Rathbone Harris. <laughs> He's the last member of the family who really had anything much to do with it. But I'm afraid I don't have any old ghost stories or skeletons in the closets there. Of course. Of course. That's okay. Um, uh, I hope I haven't wasted your time. If you don't mind my saying, sir, you do have one thing that's even better than old stories, Mr. Harris. Oh? What's that? Access. These men have studied that house about as much as a body could from the outside, but if they could have a look around on the inside... Inside? With your permission, sir, I might find something new. Well, they might be able to finally put those old stories to rest and end its insalubrious reputation. Hmm. I don't know. My lawyer would probably... I'd sign any kind of indemnity waiver he wants. It's that interesting, is it? Yes, sir. It is. Well, I've never liked my lawyer very much anyway. No sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> well, here. This key opens the side door to the cellar off Benefit Street. Oh, Carrington. Thank you. I can't imagine you'll find anything except dust and disappointment, but uh, live it up. <laughs> now, if you get yourself hurt, I'll deny this conversation ever took place. Of course. Of course. Don't you worry, sir. I'll look after him. Did you go to the house now that you had the key? <sighs> I don't recall. Clifford. I, I don't think I did. I don't remember going there. I see. Uh, did you tell your uncle that you had a key to the house? No. Why not? I... I don't know. It's hard to remember that, isn't it? Mm. Uh, do you still have the key? Uh, do you have it with you? Yes. Good. May I see it? Hm. Yes, this will do handsomely. Clifford, I'd like to hypnotize you. What? Why? Well, as you know, you've misplaced some of your memories. Uh, your treatments have helped you find some of them, and I think this could help us unlock more of them. You think you can unlock my memories with a key, eh? Why not, huh? <laughs> Lean back. Yeah, make yourself comfortable. You, you don't need to do anything but listen to my voice and keep your eye on the key. Deep breath. Good. Mm. Just relax. And watch the key. And deep breath. And watch the key. Now, I want you to count backwards from five. Go ahead. Five, four, three, two, one. Very good. 
You are completely relaxed, but you are not asleep. I want you to think back in time, after Mr. Harris gave you the key. Very well. Where is it? It's in my pocket. Good. And where are you? I'm walking down Benefit Street. It's nighttime, dark. Why did you go there in the dark? It was something Delilah said. Really? I didn't think that she shared your uh, interest in ghosts and vampires. Oh, she thought it was all nonsense, but she did observe that in stories about them, they always came out at night. I see. Is your uncle with you? No, I'm alone. Where are you going? To the house. The cellar door. I... I open it. There's a... A smell. Do you go inside? Yes. Where are you? In the cellar again. Again? Uh, Where I got stuck uh, when I was a boy. Is anyone in the house? Ah, I don't think so. Can you see anything? Yes, I have an electric torch from home. Does it look different than before? It's the same, but no. I see uncanny shapes and distorted half-phosphorescent fungi and... (gasps) Go on. There's... Among the whitish deposits. What is it? That's the huddled form I saw in the dirt as a boy. Is it? It's a sort of shimmering yellow vapor coming up from the floor. It's shaped almost like a person, but trails off. Is it coming for you? It's... no. It's going... it's going to the chimney. No, it's stopping. It's watching me. It has eyes? No. But somehow it's looking right at me. It's going now. Up the chimney. It's gone. But I can still smell it. Now what's happening? Nothing. It's gone. I wait. But still, nothing. It's time to go home. And do what? Tell Uncle Elihu. Tell him everything. That's right. You did. Yes. But how do you know that? Delilah saw you. She told the police and they told me. Delilah? Is that why the detective keeps asking questions? Tell me what happened next. I... I told Uncle Elihu what I had seen in the cellar. I I told him everything. So, those are my facts. What do you think, Uncle Elihu? I think you're a remarkable young man. I'm very proud of you, Clifford. You are? I've spent years researching that old house... I learned things, but you, you found key facts, and now you literally have the key. I couldn't be more proud of you. I, I've wanted to tell you that since you were a boy, but I couldn't encourage you back then. Too risky. But now you're ready. I've been waiting for this day. Now we can tackle it together. It's time, my boy. Time for what? To test, and if possible, destroy the horror in that house. Delilah confirmed that she helped you and your uncle procure your equipment, and that she helped you unload it at the house. Ooh, you make me look as crazy as the two of you, what with bringing all this stuff into the cellar. Careful with that, Delilah. It's very fragile. Just set the rest of it on the sidewalk, Delilah. Uh, we'll take it inside. Mm-hmm. Camp chairs, a cot. Just how long you two planning to stay here? Uh, we're not sure. We just want to be well prepared. And if the two of you don't come back, you expect me to come looking for you? No. no. Hmm. Suit yourselves. Thank you, Delilah. We appreciate it. I'm sure we'll be back before long. Mm, looks like it's gonna rain. You two best get inside. I hope you still have at least that much sense. You two be careful. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, let's get the rest of this inside before neighbors start asking questions. How did you get all this stuff anyway? I mean, the camping gear I can understand in the Edaphone recorder, but the... (laughs) I called in a few favors with some old colleagues at the laboratories at Brown to get the Crooks tube and the batteries. What does it do? 
Well, as we don't know what we're up against here, I tried to prepare for all eventualities. Should it prove intangible or invulnerable to mechanical force, the Crook's tube should allow us to inundate it with ether radiation. How does it work? Uh, When we turn it on here, electricity from this battery array moves through an induction coil here and is introduced into this vacuum tube here. The movement of the electrical particles between the cathode and the anode creates ionized rays of energy, which get emitted here if you press this trigger. (laughs) It's like a real-life ray gun! What about this? Oh my god! (laughs) Careful there. That's a flamethrower. Lent to me by a friend at the Cranston Street Armory. (laughs) If it could clear a trench of Huns in Flanders, it should suffice for anything we run into here. (laughs) (laughs) Scared? No. Nervous, maybe. Uh, Me too. (laughs) Nervous. That's all right. Scientific study and reflection teach us that the known universe of three dimensions is only the merest fraction of the whole cosmos of substance and energy. You and I have amassed a great deal of evidence indicating the tenacious existence of certain forces of great power in this house, and so far as the human point of view is concerned, exceptional malignancy. Uh, I'd say we're entitled to a few nerves. Right. (laughs) That doesn't make us superstitious. I'm not a kid anymore. I don't think we're going to see a vampire or a werewolf. Uh, uh, There was a time when you were sure there were ghosts in this house. (laughs) As men of science, we admit the possibility of certain unfamiliar and unclassified modifications of vital force and attenuated matter, existing very infrequently in three-dimensional space because of its more intimate connection with other spatial units, yet close enough to the boundary of our own to furnish us occasional manifestations, which we, for lack of a proper vantage point, may never hope to understand. Hmm. There's something here, and we don't know what it is. Like I said. Maybe some coffee? Please. I think we can agree that an incontrovertible array of facts point to some lingering influence on the house. I concur. And it seems to have begun with the French settlers from two centuries ago. Yes. And somehow, it continues to operate after their deaths. It's my theory that the Roulet family had an abnormal affinity for outer circles of entity dark spheres, which for normal folk hold only repulsion and terror. Perhaps the riots of the 1730s set in motion certain uh, kinetic patterns in the morbid brain of one or more of them. That Paul Roulet seems to have been decidedly sinister. Indeed. (laughs) What if he somehow survived being murdered and buried by the mob and continued to function in some Multiple dimension space, hell-bent on revenge. But survived how? Yeah, such a thing can no longer be thought of as a physical or biochemical impossibility. In the light of the new theories of relativity and intra-atomic action, I can easily imagine an alien nucleus of substance or energy, formless or otherwise, kept alive by imperceptible or immaterial subtractions from the life force or bodily tissues and fluids of other and more palpably living things, into which it penetrates and with whose fabric it sometimes completely merges itself. Like a vampire. Exactly. Staying alive by attacking people living in the house. Perhaps. Or maybe it's just self-preservation. It doesn't matter. Such a thing is an anomaly and an intruder whose extirpation is our utmost duty. Anne White said it was a vampire more than a hundred years ago. (laughs) Insightful, those folks from Exeter. It could be pure energy. A form ethereal and outside of the realm of substance. I suspect it's partly material. Some unknown and equivocal mass of plasticity capable of changing at will to nebulous approximations of the solid, liquid, gaseous, or tenuously unparticled states. 
The anthropomorphic patch of mould on the floor, the form of the yellowish vapour, it all argues some connection with the human shape. Look at it. There, on the ground. It looks more distinct than it did before. Hmm. Perhaps. Is it still raining outside? It sounds like it. A little. You can almost feel the decay in here. Hmm. How's that? <clears throat> decay. The mildewed walls, those rotten bits of furniture over there, the old planks and beams, the crumbling stairs. You don't feel it? Yeah. The door to the outside's unlocked. I'll check. I think our tools here should allow us to handle whatever may be here. Hard to know how long it might take. <laughs> yes, it's closed, but not locked. <laughs> We'd make quite a sight. <laughs> the two of us dashing out into Benefit Street with a flamethrower. <laughs> that would get the neighbors talking. <laughs> uh, they'd probably haul us off to Waits Asylum. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Clifford? Yes, Dr. Waite? You're still in the cellar with your uncle. I need you to tell me what's happening now. Just small talk. He's sleepy. He looks so old. I don't think I ever really appreciated just how old he is. What's he doing? Sleeping. On the cot. And you? Just staring at the crumbling masonry. A feeble light is coming in through the windows from the streetlights outside. It's... It's stuffy. I need a breath of fresh air. Did you hear something? He's talking in his sleep. I'm switching on the edaphone recorder. My uncle is stirring in his sleep. It's... 12.22 a.m. Elayu. Can you hear that? Let me get the electric torch. He's turned away from me. I'm going to cross over. He's... It's his expression. Maybe he's dreaming, but he's so agitated. He almost doesn't look like himself. His face is covered in sweat. Wait. What? I don't know if the recorder is getting this. Here, I'll reach the microphone toward. My God, that's French. Can't breathe. Elayu, Elayu. Oh, it's you. Oh, are you all right? You were oh, dreaming. Oh, yes. No. Oh, my God. <laughs> what? What did you dream? Uh, at first, it was nothing. A very ordinary series of dream pictures. But then, oh, it was of this world, and yet not of it. Shadowy, geometrical confusion. Familiar and unfamiliar. Perturbing combinations like... Pictures superimposed one upon another. Time and space seem dissolved, mixed, like a, a kaleidoscope of phantasmal images. The images? What were they? I lay in a pit with a crowd of angry faces looking down at me. Long hair and three-cornered hats. I was in an old house. But its inhabitants constantly changed. New faces, new furnishings. Even the rooms and doors changed. And the queer thing was, uh, the faces, I think they were members of the Harris family. Your breathing was... Oh, I couldn't catch my breath. <laughs> like something inside my body trying to rest my vital processes away. For a man of 80... Oh, you... 81. <laughs> Don't be trying to shortchange me. <laughs> uh, dreams. Hardly surprising. The stuff and nonsense that bubbles up with our minds so singularly focused on this house all these years. 
You were speaking French, Elayu. Was I? And you think... No. I... I don't know what to think. Are you all right? Yes, sir. I, I think so. I'm just tired. Uh, yes, yes. You young fellas need your sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Have a bit of a lie down. I'll wake you if anything happens. Are you sure? Oh, yes. Oh, where's that thermos with the coffee? So you went to sleep on the cot. What happened next? Um, I... I don't know. I think you do. I... I don't remember. You're in a safe place now. You're relaxed. You can tell me what happened after you fell asleep. I was asleep. I don't... How could I remember? Your uncle used the edophone to make a recording. I have it here, and I'm going to play it for you. Remember, you're perfectly safe here. Is that you, Clifford? That? I don't know. That, that could be, be any. It sounds like your sleep is on easy. I'm sorry, but I don't... Shh, my God. Listen to this. What happened, Clifford? I... I don't know. I think you do know. You woke up. What did you do? Uh... A scream! So you heard a scream. It was your uncle? Did I? You just said you did. Right. Yes. But after that, I, I really don't... What happened to your uncle? Are you not listening to me? I don't remember. What did you do, Clifford? Did you hurt your uncle? What? No! God, no! I, I had to get out. You went outside? Yes, I think so. You did. We have witnesses who saw you walking past the Athenaeum. That may be. I, I don't really... It happened, Clifford. You were there. It was raining. Where did you go? Uh, home? I don't want you to guess. You need to remember what happened. I went home. That's right. Delilah saw you there. Do you remember what you did? I... I made a telephone call. Who did you call? Butterfield's hardware store. That's right. Charge it to the Babbitt account. I'll need a pickaxe, a spade, and acid. The strongest. Yes, hydrochloric. What's the biggest size you have? A carboy? Um, I'll take four. No, make it six. A what? Oh, right, yes, a gas mask, of course. Yes, I'll need that, add that. No, 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 I need it delivered as soon as possible. 135 Benefit Street. The cellar door. Mm-hmm. Yes, thank you. Clifford? Delilah. What's all that about? I didn't know you were... Well? You shouldn't... I I can't tell you. What do you mean you can't tell me? Where's Dr. Whipple? He's... We... Clifford? What's happened? You know there's nothing you can't tell me. Not this. Please, just stay out of it. Clifford! I'm sorry. I'll... Forgive me. A shovel? Acid? Why did you need these things, Clifford? I, I don't know. Why did you need to dig in the cellar? What happened to your uncle? I, I, I don't know. Yes, you do. You heard him scream. Did you kill Elihu Whipple? What? No, I would never. Maybe uh, you weren't in control of your faculty. I would never. I would never do that, ever. Then tell me what you saw. I can't. You must. I... I wasn't facing him. I was facing the door when I heard him cry out. The room. There was this yellowish glow. And, and this stench. Uh, I turned to look. I'll keep going. What did you see? It was worse than I had dreaded. Oh, God. The earth was ridden with fungus. A vaporous corpse-like, yellow and diseased, steamed up, bubbled and lapped to a gigantic height in a humanoid outline. I could see the chimney and the fireplace through it. It was all eyes, wolfish and mocking, and the head, like an insect's dissolved 
at the top to a thin stream of mist, which finally vanished up the chimney. But no. So it w- was like a ghost. Ha! No! God, no! It was a seething, dimly phosphorescent cloud of fungus loathsomeness enveloping and dissolving the one object to which all my attention was focused. And what was that? My uncle, Eli U. Whipple. He was leering and gibbering at me. His features were blackening and decaying right in front of me. He reached out, dripping claws, to rend me in the fury which this horror had brought. Oh, my God. I drilled myself in preparation for this crucial moment, and blind training saved me. This bubbling evil was nothing material chemistry could hurt, so I ignored the flamethrower and threw the current on the ray gun. The, the energy device? Yes. I aimed the ether radiations and fired. There was a bluish haze and a frenzied sputtering. You fired at your uncle? What, what happened? It had no effect whatever. It was then that I saw the fresh horror that sent me reeling into the street. Yes? In that dim blend of blue and yellow, the form of my uncle had commenced a nauseous liquefaction that eludes all description. Lit by the mixed and uncertain rays, he was at once a devil and a multitude, a charnel house and a pageant. His gelatinous face assumed a dozen, a a hundred aspects, grinning as it sank to the ground on a body that melted like tallow, in likeness strange and yet not strange. What? uh, Who? I saw the features of the Harrises. I had seen their portraits, and here they were again. Young, old, male, female, familiar and unfamiliar. Toward the last, a blend of faces of servants and Babies flickered close to the floor where a pool of greenish grease was spreading. And it seemed as though the shifting features fought against themselves and and strove to form contours like those of my uncle's kindly face. Oh, Clifford. I think that at that moment, he still existed. I think he tried to bid me farewell. My word. I... I staggered out into the street, down Hopkins Street and over the bridge, I I don't know where. But I looked back as the dawn unfolded wetly from the east and beckoned me to the place where my terrible work was still unfinished. Wait, you you went back to that house? Yes. You didn't go for help? Help? Who could help with this? Who could I tell? What about Delilah? No, no. How could I tell her? Well... Yes, I see. Uh, Inside, the grease was gone. Drawn into the porous floor, and in front of the fireplace was no vestige of the giant double-up form in nitre. I looked at the cot, the chairs, the instruments, and the yellow straw hat of my uncle. I was in a daze. I could scarcely recall what was dream and what was reality. Could it all have been a dream? I wish it was. I wish it was, Doctor. I witnessed things more horrible than I could dream. I sat on the cot and thought just what had happened, and how I might end the horror. Clifford, what you've described to me, you know it can't have been... Real? I don't know what it was, Doctor, but it was real. It didn't seem to be matter, or ether, nor anything else conceivable by mortal mind. What then but some exotic emanation, some vampirish vapor such as Exeter rustic say lurks over certain churchyards? This, I felt, was the clue. And again I looked at the floor in front of the fireplace, where the mold and night had taken strange forms. In ten minutes, I made up my mind and set out for home. There, I bathed, ate, and called Butterfields with my order. And that's when you... At 11 a.m. the next day, I commenced digging. It was sunny weather, and I was glad for that. I was still alone, for as much as I feared the unknown horror I sought, there was more fear in the thought of telling anybody. Did you see anything in the dirt? As I turned up the stinking black earth in front of the fireplace... I tremble at the thoughts of what I might uncover. Some secrets are not good for mankind, and this was one of them. You 
really shouldn't have... Too late for that, Doctor. After a while, I was standing in the large hole I had dug. It was now about six feet square, and the evil smell had increased. I no longer doubted that I was about to make contact with the hellish thing whose emanations had cursed the house for over a century and a half. I wondered what it would look like, what its form and substance would be. At length, I climbed out of the hole and dispersed the heaped up dirt, then arranged the great carboys of acid around and near two sides so that I might empty them into the pit in quick succession. I continued my excavation. The smell grew so bad that I put on the gas mask. I was unnerved at my proximity to a nameless thing at the bottom of the pit. Then suddenly... Good God, man, what was it? I steeled myself and scraped away more dirt in the light of the electric torch. There was tissue of some kind, fishy and glassy. A kind of semi-putrid, congealed jelly with suggestions of translucency. I scraped further and saw that it had a form. It was more than a foot across, and it was somewhat spherical. It took me a moment to understand what I was looking at. And then it opened, and it... It looked at me. It didn't. I scrambled out of the hole, and in a terrific panic, I unsopped four carboys of acid. The blinding maelstrom of greenish yellow vapor surged up as the floods of acid descended. It was shocking, unspeakably so. I emptied down the two remaining carboys for good measure. Then, after the bubbling stopped, I felt it safe to shovel the earth back into the pit. It was twilight before I was done, but fear had gone out of the place. The dampness was less fetid, and all the strange fungi had withered to a kind of harmless grayish powder which blew ash-like across the floor. Do, do you think it worked? Is, is it gone? One of Earth's nethermost terrors perished forever, and if there be a hell, it had received at last the demon soul of an unhallowed thing. Good Lord. Uh, uh, and your poor uncle, uh, there was no more sign of his... No. No, Doctor. That Edaphone cylinder you have there, that's all that's left of him. May I see it? Uh, of, of course. Clifford, what have you done? That was... Mine! To do with as I see fit. And I don't want to hear that recording ever again. Damn you for making me listen to it. Clifford, I'm... <laughs> Uh, it's all right. You're safe here. I believe you. <laughs> Good. But who's going to believe you? That detective outside the door or... Delilah? We should talk about that. Should we? No, I don't think we should. We're done here, Doctor. It's been months since that dreadful night in that shunned house. I padded down the last of the earth over my dear uncle's final resting place. And I shed the first of what I know will be many tears in his memory. <clears throat> but Carrington Harris finally rented the place. He's renovating it for the new tenants. He actually thanked me. Really? Walk by it sometime, you'll see. The barren old trees in the yard, they have blossoms on them. And last week, I saw a pair of birds nesting in their gnarled boughs. You've been listening to The Shunned House, brought to you by our sponsor, Veronal, your secret for a really, really sound night's sleep. I'm Lester Mayhew. Until next week, this is Dark Adventure Radio Theater reminding you to never go anywhere alone. If it looks bad, don't look and save the last bullet for yourself. The Shunned House was adapted for radio and produced by Sean Branny and Andrew Lehman, based on the story by H.P. Lovecraft. Original music by Troy Sterling Neese. The Dark Adventure Ensemble featured Annie Abrams, Rick Bataya, Sean Branny, Casey Camp, Ken Clement, Matt Foyer, Holly Hunt, McCarran Kelly, Andrew Lehman, Kevin Stidham, Josh Temke, Sarah Vanderpool, Julie Weisenberg, and Time Winters. Tune in next week for 
Newt Bard in the Forbidden Fjord, a tale of virile Viking raiders. Dark Adventure Radio Theater is a production of the HPLHS Broadcasting Group, a subsidiary of HPLHS Incorporated, copyright 1931, plus 92.